Hello everybody, welcome back to the Enterprise Risk Management section. It's relatively short um, and, and in here is where the risk theory is contained. Um, so um, the, the case study that comes in the final of the module, the fourth module, it will require you to assess um, a risk or enterprise-wide risk management framework. Um, and so some of the theory here, um, you, will, you will be putting it into practice. Let's have a look at it. Okay, so the first place I'd like to start is is really with the IPS, the Investment Policy Statement, um, and we're talking about, of course, the the return objectives and and the constraints, um, return and risk objectives here. So, the um, the risk tolerance, um, the relevance of this with the case study, should we even be investing in the first place? Um, is, does this fit within our, our overall risk tolerance? Um, and um, my tip here would be um, to particularly consider, you know, the the um, the investment size um, compared to the assets under under management as well. So when you're looking at the you know the overall overall risk, whether it might be liquidity risk or overall risk, you've got to think about the overall context. Um, as one of the things to think about there as well. Um, and then thinking about the, does the investment kind of fit with our, um, yeah, within our, within our risk tolerance? And that can be defined in a number of ways we're going to explore shortly. So, so yeah, the goals and objectives um, that we have, and it's not just what we're doing, but the way we want to do it as well. Um, there are certain types of investments that may, may or may not fit within our, within our, our greed profile. Now, um, the, the board. So who sets the risk tolerance overall at the board? Um, rather than being any one individual, um, and that might, that might be, um, you know, um, a, a number, certain number of people involved in that rather than any one person. Um, and um, within, within risk, having a, a detailed risk framework, and, and that's really the committees, the organisational structures, the way the accountabilities, the way in which decisions are going to be made. Now, for the case study uh, in the last module, there is a risk committee, um, and many of the things you're going to going to evaluate whether they do them well or whether they could make improvements to that. But I guess there's a bit of everything in there. Um, some things that you can certainly say, yes, yeah, that's, that's a good way to approach things. Other things they could perhaps have improved. Um, when you look at the at the uh, perspectives, then here, guys, top down firstly by the board, um, and um, re relatively top down as well that the chief risk officer, the CRO, um, tr translating the appetite, translating the approach into policies and processes, and and very importantly as well, have providing forms of challenge um, to make sure that the the institution maintains and keeps. To the right level of risk approach, in the in the risk work that I do and in the other risk uh, exams that I teach, like the FRM, there are lots of examples in real life of, of rogue CEOs or or, or rogue um, rogue individuals really who are so powerful or charismatic, or whatever you might like to say it, that kind of um, yeah they kind of lead the firm over the cliff. Uh, in that way, and and it takes a strong CRO, someone who can uh, who can challenge and can can keep the organisation to to task in a way to the agreed goals, and and that's really why you want the the board, the rather than any one individual, the board um, keeping to those goals and objectives and and tolerance. Now the investment team form more the bottom up part of the of the risk risk uh, setup, um, and they're going to implement the the risks the the investment strategy that could be internally by way of uh, internal managers or it could be working with external managers. Um, either way, their job is also to monitor the risks going forward as well. Um, now, our, our case study will give you three time horizons. You're going to meet them at the start, going to meet them three years on, and then another two years on as well. So there's a fair amount of, of continuous monitoring and, and new information that comes up with this case study. Now, risk management process. Um, there are lots of generic terms that we might see in, in real life. Many of these appear in our chapter, but there's a risk management process 
Um, the kind of starting point of any process is the pol policy um, and the, the, the board have already set the risk tolerance and the framework. That's step number one normally. And then would come identifying the risks, measuring risks, um, often prioritizing the risks as well, prioritizing them, um, managing and mitigating the risks. Just bear in mind when it comes to managing and mitigating, a point I've made a bit later on, um, it's not it's not about eliminating risks. So is, is it about taking away all risks, hedging all the risks? Well, we know that in CFA level three, if you were to take away all the risks, then at best you're going to get just a risk-free return. So you need to leave those risks, let them play, um, but it's got to be the risks that fall within your appetite. So that's quite important. Um, it's not about taking away all risk at all. It's about uh, taking the right risks. Um, um, monitoring, monitoring risks and dashboards. Um, always talk about uh, key risk indicators, like on a car, a car, a car dashboard. When your fuel, your fuel's getting low, you get alerted, an early warning indicator. Um, yeah, when the temperature of the car starts to overheat, you need to know about it as well. Or perhaps there's more of a dia diagnostic problem um, to, you know, to take your car in to get checked out. And there's obviously something there that needs to be investigated. So the, having early warning and the contacts guys here of liquidity indicators is going to be quite, quite important too. Reporting and escalation, having good information reported, and then be, being able to, to make some key decisions. And, and um, key decisions here will be whether, <clears throat> whether to, firstly, it's going to be whether you're going to invest, um, and then when when to exit, when's the right time to exit as well. So, so um, the... Um, the perspectives of risk coming through here, many of these are, are ideas of, of risk management you've seen before. Um, looking at asset level or looking more at a wider portfolio level uh, too. When, when we are looking at individual assets, the book talks about that some, some ways of investing, perhaps in the areas of hedge funds, a um, bit of a question mark whether you're gonna get access to that level of information. And the asset level, they actually also called the holdings approach coming up shortly as well. So um, in traditional, traditional investing, yes, you might have lots of asset or holdings level detailed information. But um, within, a, within a hedge fund, you're not providing or given that level of transparency, more of a proprietary um, idea, not going to be, be disclosing all that. So at the portfolio level, some of the things to, to fact to th think about here would be the overall factors you're taking on board. What, uh, what are the key factors? And um, we've seen a, a factor analysis in equity. We've seen factor analysis as well in as asset allocation. It's the idea of looking through, you know, looking through your assets. What are the drivers? And um, key drivers uh, in, in the case study we're going to see are going to be emerging markets. That's one of the key drivers to be, to be aware of, guys, here. That both of the areas, private equity and infrastructure, you, you are going to be in parts of the world in smaller emerging markets. Uh, and so uh, the areas like, like the, the, eco the economy uh, and the um, economic cycle, for, exa for example, they're going to have quite a big impact, um, could have quite detrimental impacts in downturns. Uh, money flowing out, and um, also you must want to have a look as well, guys, at the industry. Industry and, and the products involved. Again, you'll notice that when we get into it, you'll see that it brings in specific risk factors coming in as well. For example, is your product more of a discretionary spend that um, people tend to buy in the good times, or is it something that people are kind of a must have? Um, is it more of a defensive or is it more of, of a cyclical type, type product or industry, if you like to? Um, so, so when you are thinking about exposures and common exposures, um, uh, always think back to perhaps to long-term uh, capital management um, in the 19, famous 1998 period, you know, where they had lots of different different assets, but they were heavily correlated to similar exposures, um, particularly in the area of credit risk, for example. 
Correlations can be pretty low in the good times, but we know they can change quite quickly in, in a downturn. Now, um, the, the, the idea of making decisions based upon, upon different types of information, um, looking back at past returns to, to think about um, what, what the future returns might be like. Well, looking back, they call that the returns-based or historic returns data approach, looking back at the past, which is easy to, to um, look at that data usually, um, that it's much faster, cheaper, less costly. Um, and um, they're, they're kind of a bit of a warning, though, that the past might be nothing like, of course, the future might not reflect uh, the future. Well, when you're looking um, at hedge funds, though, well, the um, the holdings might not be available for other asset classes. Yet, what about if you can get access to the holdings themselves? Then you can get a lot more of a better understanding of them. So um, the holdings-based approach is also something that you'll see in the equity reading as well. Um, yes, it's more time-consuming. Yes, it's more costly. But some of the benefits of looking at the holdings are all around the style. Is it growth? Is it value? Is it momentum? Um, uh, what, what are the what are the characteristics uh, in terms of PE multiples or growth or income? What are the characteristics of, of the fund itself? Um, and perhaps you can better understand from the style then more about the future prospects. So holdings based, you're looking more at the assets and making conclusions, that particularly about the styles and, and future prospects for those styles. Now, um, and enterprise risk management continues with the theme of perspectives in terms of how we're looking at risk now. Um, and the, the reading is quite clear that um, they don't want to go deep at all into too much into the risk metrics. So that's um, reserved for elsewhere in, um, in level three. Standard deviation, I know you know, know very well the volatility, looking at the range of volatility. Um, the parts of the world that we're involved in, like in emerging markets, like in areas like private equity and, and real estate, I guess a bit a big big point to mention linked to the first module is smoothing, isn't it? That the, the volatility that we're going to see and be aware of, um, you know, that's a big question mark. The idea that it's going to be relatively fake. Um, it's going to be fake low, isn't it? Fake too low. Uh, it's not going to represent the real level of volatility. Unsmoothing give you a much clearer picture. But now um, the other measures, guys, here of value at risk and conditional value at risk are only mentioned in passing. As a risk instructor, you know, I think you could expect me to give you a little bit on this. I will do. But um, are, are you going to be tested to any great degree on this in, in this reading? They say, no, no, you're not. So because it's mentioned in passing, that's what I'm going to do as well. Now, um, uh, value at risk uh, as a as a measure. Firstly, then, um, it's a measure of of um, of what we call an unexpected loss. And unexpected losses, guys, are low frequency, high impact losses. So, 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 uh, so unexpected losses don't happen all, all that often. Um, and um, the idea of value at risk is to put a, a monetary figure on how much that might loss might be as an estimate either at a 95 or 99 confidence level. So guys, confidence levels, we know are, are forms of probability 95% perhaps or 99 or even 99.9. .9. So, so one thing that a VAR is, if you look at the um, at, at the diagram I have guys here, it's um, it's a, it's a, it's a, quite a severe loss, isn't it? Um, so for example, the uh, 1 million is our estimate here of a relatively severe loss over a given holding period. Now, the, these, um, these standalone measures of loss are relatively short term in nature, normally no more than a year. So it could be one day, a one day value at risk, a VAR, it could be of 10 days. In fact, 10 days was a very popular 
uh, holding period for for um, for many many years since VAR um, has kind of been used by, by by regulators in in the banking world as well. So from 1996 onwards, a 10 day holding period was relatively common. Now, um, when the crisis hit in 2008, it became very clear that 10 days was was vastly insufficient for most assets that were held. Um, can you always sell in 10 days? What about those toxic CDOs, for example? So this idea of, of uh, thinking more about liquidity risk really changed the nature of, of VAR. VAR does not incorporate liquidity risk to any degree at all. So even thinking about a one-year period of, of some assets, that, that might not allow for liquidity risk that that great. Um, the um, So guys, VAR being a measure of risk. Now, beyond our VAR here, notice we have what we call tail risk, sometimes called tail risk VAR. In the book, we call this conditional VAR. So conditional VAR, the definition, is the average loss beyond the VAR, beyond the VAR. Put another way, guys, the average loss in the tail. So VAR does not describe that the 5% of time when the losses may get, may, may get even worse. And of course, the, the most severe losses lie in the tail. Now, typically to explore the tail, um, techniques that you, you might bring up here, Monte Carlo simulation, uh, stress, stress testing, of course, coming in as well. Um, we get the chance to say, well, what if? What if uh, conditions are far worse? What if we're in those emerging markets and, and it's a downturn? What if our, our baseline numbers are way off? And so in the case study, whenever you see mention of of some numbers by way of a baseline estimate, that's probably going to be, you know, a very much positive, normal conditions, pr pretty much um, everything's going our, our, our way. What about in a situation where things don't go our way, when, when um, maybe even our very survival may be in question? And um, what we should try and do then is explore the cash flows in, in all these scenarios um, and what it would mean, what it mean in terms of returns. If you go into the, these things with your rosy, you know, rosy eyed and um, uh, rose tinted spectacles, thinking it's going to be all kind of, uh, yeah, all, all easy, easy, easy returns, guys, we could get a nasty surprise. So what we're, what we're uh, talking about here, thinking about the case study is, are you going to be required to talk very much about standard deviations, value at risk, continue of, um, conditional value at risk? Likely not. Likely not that much. Um, drawdown is one last one as well, measuring the drops in a portfolio used heavily in areas like hedge funds. Daily drop, weekly drop, monthly, quarterly drop. Um, oftentimes, uh, maximum drawdown over... I should say return over maximum drawdown, turn it into a risk adjusted measure as well. So, so what the book is saying here, they're not going to really test you that much on, on the specifics of what of these four. Um, um, the one that, that they're going to bring in a lot more, I'd say, would be Monte Carlo simulation, as I've mentioned. They want you to use Monte Carlo simulation on, on, any, on any of your estimates for this business proposition, whether it might be customer numbers, sales, whether it might be um, costs, for example, um, and particularly involving the institution's cash flows, all right? So cash flows in, cash flows out, probabilities, um, an so example of that might be in the area of donations. If you're an endowment or a foundation, you're relying upon, upon donations, well, they might dry up in a crisis. That should be factored in into your, your number crunching. Now, the, the book recognises both the number, number approach, the quant approach, and also more the expert uh, scenario, human scenario approach as well. Um, but it does pick up on some biases and some issues with both approaches. Um, firstly, they're both pretty backward looking. With the quant-based approach, you know, you're know, you perhaps looking back at past estimates and past data, past periods, um, and using a lot of that in your, in your future numbers. 
Um, and um, when you're kind of looking at scenarios, perhaps you, you as an individual, you as a, as the person doing the research, well, you've got your own biases as well. That um, a good example I always think with this one is the is the subprime mortgage crisis. Um, many of the of the experts, as I should say, um, they'd never seen falls in in house house prices throughout their career. Now, if they've never experienced it themselves, very tough or difficult for them to be open, perhaps of that, that happening in the future or to even build that in as a scenario. So that's what the book is saying, guys, here, that, that be aware of our own biases, perhaps through our own, our own biased experience. Now, although... Um, Enterprise-wide risk management incorporates every risk. That's the idea, incorporate every risk. Let's give you a few of them here. Credit risk, market risk, um, the operational side of things, operations, the operational risk. Um, operational risk we often define as uh, as people, that our people, our, our processes. Yeah, people are processes, are systems, um, and are external external events. COVID pandemic clearly, a, you know, an external event affecting pretty much all parts of any business there. But guys, are are operational risk, people, processes, systems, and and our external events that might happen. Um, number four things like liquidity risk, um, regulatory risk coming through. Um, this is especially important when you're investing abroad in different jurisdictions that you may be more unaware of. Um, and we've mentioned as well things like reputational risk too. So again, the case that is coming up, you're going to recognise a lot of these coming through, some some especially. Um, watch out for the, that um, reputational risk especially. Um, now, there are, there are in the text two, they call these overlooked risks that um gotta watch gotta watch out for and um, one of one of which they mention as being the currency impact so you know oftentimes when you're in emerging markets that devaluation um could be quite a surprise particularly if it's more of a crisis um and uh, and also your uh, the asset allocation drift you know drifting into risk profiles that you hadn't intended so um yeah that idea of asset allocation drift um, being aware and currency risk especially as well. Now I've talked a lot about who defines the board of directors define the risk tolerance for the, for this institution, often managed by the investment committees, of course. And then um, I looked at the steps on the previous slide: the risk management process, identifying, measuring, assessing, mitigating. Um, yeah, measuring reporting risks as well. Remember, it's not about taking away all risks. It's about keeping to the desired risk profile. The one, the one that we haven't mentioned on this slide that will be important too, comes up in the next module as well. The, the environmental, social and governments, the ESG, very much in vogue. A lot more of that coming up in the next module. And they, they are very important for the case study. Now, how do you go about setting um, your your risk tolerance? So the, the text has a few notes about this I wanted to bring back, make sure that you're okay with. Th this slide links very heavily to the IPS, guys, our investment policy statement, of course. So we're here in the risk objective. We've got those two dimensions of the willingness and the ability or capacity to take risk. Um, and uh, I mentioned about the board, the board very much linking to the stated objectives and constraints uh, of the IPS here. Now, they give um, two main ideas. Is it an asset only institution, more like your sovereign wealth fund, endowment or foundation? Or you know, are we in the area of an asset liability management uh, uh, approach like a pension fund, insurance company or, or bank? Um and they're just mentioning that as, as the starting point, how you're going to define risk. Is it standalone or is it going to be entwined, ever entwined, where you have to think about the nature of the liabilities too? 
and, and so the the slide here just summarizes the the many of the metrics that you know about you know about in the past and what the the chapters here is just su suggesting that that all these could be used um in defining different risks for example um vol volatility limits Maybe you, you have a budget, a limit that you're going to have in there, or maximum drawdown limits that you might have in there too. Um, maybe you're managing to a, a, um, an estimate of VAR, a VAR estimate, um, or um, being aware that VAR is defined by a confidence level, whether it might be 95% or maybe 95% VAR confidence level. Um, but being, being aware that 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 doesn't mean losses can't be greater. If you go beyond the VAR, and and uh, we did that on our previous slide here. If you have a VAR, say that was at ninety five percent, and that happened to be I don't know one million there. Um, that's um, telling you that perhaps in normal conditions the maximum loss might be one million, but it's also saying that you have a tail risk. Um, and that that um, that tail risk, sometimes called tail var, uh, also called in real life expected shortfall. Uh, in our chapter, we call that conditional var. So, guys, conditional var being beyond the var there is the average loss beyond the var. So, when you are exploring how bad losses get, something like value at risk would be more like an unexpected level of losses. Whereas conditional value at risk would more be like a catastrophic, um, your catastrophic or if you like crisis level of losses, which is is well not be that likely could well be possible. Now conditional var is also known as expected tail loss in the reading. Um, in real life, it's actually called expected shortfall by by many regulators around the world. Now leverage limits. Um, if you're heavily leveraged, you're going to lose your equity far quicker. Um, so you might well want to set some li limits on leverage. But very, very interestingly, um, just by way of in passing, Basel III, guys, the, the banking um, legislation, global banking banking regulation, actually has a lot of freedom for leverage. But um, for many banks, allowing something like 33 to 1, which is pretty staggering. So this level of leverage is not just on, in, in terms of hedge funds, that there are there are certain investors out there maybe pretty, pretty well heavily le levered up. Now, restricting use of derivatives and selling options, short positions, that kind of thing. Maybe derivatives can be very beneficial, as we know in level 3, to risk manage positions and to reduce risk. But the use of them and how how are you going to be um, very clear about that it makes sense to define that clearly in in your risk tolerance. Um, limits on on illiquid holdings. We saw uh, in our first module, Harvard. Harvard had an extremely high allocation to private equity and real estate and hedge funds, much higher than might seem prudent, um, and they were really caught out in in that way. If we're thinking about asset only uh, defining risk tolerance, you might define tracking error, like in the equity track uh, chapter, active risk, for example, there, active share, active risk, those things you've seen before when you're thinking about compared to a benchmark, limiting the tracking error. Now, who is it's going to implement the strategic asset allocation? It's going to be the investment team, um, and that could be with an internal team, or it could be with external fund managers. And then their job also would be to manage, guys, manage and monitor the risks that we're taking. That due diligence also continues as conditions change, as the projects change as well. And what we're gonna see um, in the very last of the modules are, are a number of investment committee meetings, right? So you're gonna meet them, you'll be part of the team in the first meeting, uh, time zero, uh, three years will go by. The investment team have a an update meeting. And you'll get to see and analyze some new data. Then finally, a, a further two years have gone by um, and uh, new data appears. So this monitoring process, the case study actually takes you through the life cycle um, kind of at the start, time zero, three, year, three years on, and then a further two years on, for five years in total from the start.
Now, our, our objective in terms of risk is not to eliminate risk because we want to bring, bring back some return. An analogy here would be cooking a meal, right? So cooking a meal, going to get the right level of heat. If you're perhaps using an oven or a microwave, got to get the right level of heat, the right, the right time to make sure that, you, that your meal comes out there the other end exactly as you want it. You don't want too much heat or too little heat. Got to have the right level of risk or heat um, in your project as well. Now, um, I mentioned to you that that the reading doesn't require doesn't require that much of of a technical look at value at risk or conditional value at risk. But by way of a quick recap, also, you know, you wouldn't expect any less from a bit of a risk nerd, nerd like myself. So, but by way of a, a very quick recap, I'm going to um, quickly mention a couple of minutes max on this, no more. So, so, so value at risk. Um, when we put it in in contrast, it's not really about expected losses, but it is about the unexpected losses, not about catastrophic losses either. So this is a, a, a risk uh, technique or method really focused on those unexpected losses. And you classify expected losses as a high frequency, low impact um, unexpected as low frequency, high impact, then catastrophic, very low frequency, very high impact. So, so these unexpected losses are relatively severe, but they're not the worst. They're not worst case. Now, the reason why they're not the worst ones is VAR typically uses a, a confidence level like 95 um, as a typical or even 99, 99.9. And, and so in the tail, guys, here in the tail, we'll change color here. Yeah, here in, in the tail, there are worse losses. Yeah, here in the tail, there are, there are worse losses. Um, and so value at risk is very much a, a severe, but not the worst case. Now, value at risk is over a time period. In this case here, we have a one day VAR. Um, and, and so in the book, it's talking about this met metric like value at risk being a relatively short term. Guys, it's relatively short term metric. Now, the, the, a much more preferred metric in your answers, I'd recommend you talk about Monte Carlo simulation because these institutions are planning, you know, um, 20 year, 25 year plans. Um, so guys, Monte Carlo, much more appropriate as a long-term metric. Now, VARs uh, sometimes talk in terms of confidence levels, like the 95% confidence level. Um, and um, if you have a loss, guys, here, say of 1 million, um, then we're 95% confident that the loss won't be any higher. If you like, the confidence level becomes a maximum loss at that confidence level. But there is an error, and we call the error the significance level, as you know, um, and that being the 5% chance of a loss beyond the VAR. So uh, if we talk about a 5% VAR, we're using the significance level. If we're talking about a 95% VAR, we're talking about the confidence level. And that can confuse people sometimes. Sometimes I mention 95% VAR of 1 million. Um, that's the confidence level, or a 5% VAR of 1 million, that's the significance level, meaning the very same thing. There's always a chance it's going to be in the tail, um, a 5% chance of that happening. So in this example, guys, here with a 95% VAR, here they've referenced the confidence level is 1 million, means, guys, there's a 95% chance uh, that the loss won't be any higher, or 95 days out of 100, won't be any higher than 1 million, according to our estimate. Um, and that means there's going to be an error. There's a 5% chance it's going to be higher. Now, um, we know that VARs are only estimates, like predicting the weather. Uh, here we are, guys, coming into the fall or autumn time. Um, will it be a severe winter? 
Um, will it be a catastrophic winter? Will it be just an expected or average winter? We know who, who can predict what this winter will be like. Certainly not the weather forecasters, that's for sure. So the stress testing and the, the, scenario, the scenario analysis um, very much needed to, to look beyond the VAR. What if our estimate is wrong? Make sure we have those contingency plans in, in place. Now, uh, conditional VAR is also known in the text as um, uh, tail, tail VAR, in real life also known as expected shortfall. So, so, so my tip, just to finish off on this, on these risk met metrics, look to try and include some stress testing in your answers. Look to try and include some Monte Carlo simulation in your answers, especially when you see any baseline estimates. Baseline estimates for customer numbers, baseline estimates for perhaps uh, for revenue based on the estimates uh, aren't going to be that that robust. Um, even for things like climate risk, make sure you look at what if analysis as well. Okay, guys, that's the end of module number two on enterprise risk management. Just before we we leave, um, just to remind you, I guess, of the a key learning objective of, of this uh, case study is to, to assess and to make recommendations for improvements um, in terms of the enterprise risk management. And a key little tip here that I think I've noticed as far as a theme goes, that um, we'll talk a lot more about in our, in our final uh, module, the case study, is Monte Carlo simulation. So um, thinking about the long-term investors, thinking about pensions and endowments and foundations, sovereign wealth funds, of course, as well, where they're needing to model cash flows, cash flows coming in, cash flows coming out, they're, uh, they're planned over many years of a long time horizons. Um, their Monte Carlo simulation is going to be very useful. And especially as well is the aspect of direct investments. You know, where you are um, investing in a business directly in terms of the business management model as well. So here you're using the um, Monte Carlo simulation for revenues and costs. And so think in terms of baseline um, normal conditions and also think in terms of stress conditions and uh, also in terms of more like crisis conditions as well. So um, I'll see you back in the uh, third of the three. Next up is going to be some climate risk. Uh, ESG guys forms the next module. See you back for the next one.